Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Gavin is a GP, but no ordinary doctor. He has been on expeditions to the Arctic, the Antarctic. He's island hopped across the world. He's extraordinarily well read, and he's written a series of fascinating award-winning books um, in which he thinks deeply about the human condition through journeys through our body as well as journeys through um, the planet. Um, such an exciting array of titles to discuss this morning. Um, mm. But Gavin, welcome to the EA Festival. Thank you, John. Thank you uh, to all of you here in East Anglia Festival inviting me down. It's the first time I've ever been in a marquee tent with a bar at the back. <laughs> <laughs> book, book festivals with associated bar, I think it should catch on. So, thank you. <laughs> Would you like a gin and tonic before we start? <laughs> after, after. <laughs> um, it's unusual for a GP to be such a prolific writer. Can you tell us what drove you to start writing and, and, and mm. what do you hope to achieve? Who are you writing for? Yeah, well, when I was a little boy growing up in, I grew up in Fife in Scotland and uh, originally I wanted to be a geographer just because I loved maps so much and I wanted to travel, see the world, create maps that would help me make sense of the world. And then um, sometime when I was at high school, really, I fell in love with biology. Somebody gave me an atlas of anatomy and I fell in love with that other kind of atlas. So I decided to go to medical school instead of uh, becoming a geographer. And uh, I spent a long time after medical school traveling, so combining both loves. And the reason I began to write was essentially because I've always been such a reader. I love reading books. I've been just since very early childhood, I was a great um, journey are in fiction and in non-fiction and in these wonderful big old atlases and it was natural for me to want to write the book that I would most want to pick up in the bookshop and so um, you know medical school and junior doctor training doesn't leave much time for that kind of thing but when I finally got my first job as an expedition doctor I went south to uh, Antarctica for 14 months as the only doctor on a very small research station and it was this time suddenly opened up to be able to begin to write. So that's what I wrote my first book in Antarctica. It was actually about the Arctic. It was about a previous trip I'd done in the Arctic, but I wrote it in the Antarctic. And I loved that process so much that I came back, I got a publisher, it did reasonably well. I thought, oh, I'll write another one. I wrote one about the Antarctic. And then I wrote one about medicine, and then it just kept going from there. So and Kevin, you have an in incredible talent of weaving science and literature together, as mm. hopefully we'll discover. So mm. I thought we'd dive into Adventures in Human Being, mm. available for sale over there afterwards. <laughs> uh, book of the Year for the Sunday Times, The Observer and The Economist. Uh, has some tantalising chapter titles, including Inner Ear, Voodoo and Vertigo, and Large Bowel and Rectum, a magnificent work of art. <laughs> um, Gavin, your rectum might be a magnificent work of art. <laughs> Not sure about mine. <laughs> it's all in how you depict it. Right. <laughs> Um, it's all in the delivery. <laughs> uh, I don't really want to think about that. <laughs> yeah. um, you start with the brain and a gripping account of uh -huh. um, brain surgery on a woman you call Claire who suffered terrible epileptic seizures mm. and was so desperate that she decided um, to go under the saw rather than the knife and mm -hmm. have her head um, carved open. And... Um, it's so dramatic. I wondered if you could just read a little bit mm. from <laughs> sure. your book. Gavin is a sort of, uh, a, were you a student at this point? No, no, I was a, a senior house officer, as oh. they used to call you, in right. uh, neurosurgery. So you were qualified, but you weren't yeah. doing the neurosurgery bit. I was, I was sort of holding the, <laughs> holding the suction. Right. And then occasionally they would, the, the professor would so dissect around the brain tumour and then he would take away all the capillaries, bleeders, and then he would separate all the scar tissue and then he would say, do you want to take out the tumour? So he just, but then by then it was just lifting it out. So just to set the scene, uh -huh. she, Claire has gone under anaesthetic. Yep. Uh, the neurosurgeon, who is a brilliant man known to operate 16 hours on the trot without sitting down, yeah. has got his saw out and has... Her, is soaring a hole in her head. Is that right? Yeah, well, this is, um, this is a moment. This, for this particular kind of procedure, if you've got to remove a part of somebody's brain, but it's very close to the area of the brain which produces speech, that's a very dangerous procedure um, in the sense that if you just slightly damage the bit of brain that is involved in producing speech, 
they call that eloquent brain. If you damage eloquent brain, you can't restore it. Whereas a lot of the rest of the brain can adapt and recover from injury, as we all know from people we know who've had strokes and recovered very well. Um, so yeah, he's about to, he's trying to delineate which part of the brain is eloquent so he doesn't damage it. And for that to happen, the patient has to be awake during surgery. So yeah, they've taken off the top of the skull, uh, put a lot of long acting anesthetic around the skull rim, the raw kind of skull rim, and then woken the patient up. And then the patient is asked to speak while, while they, they progressively knock out different bits of brain with electricity to see which bits are producing the speech. That's why we're doing this after lunch. <laughs> okay. So John jo read, read this book and said, you've got to read this bit about chopping out bits of brain. So <laughs> here we are. Suck, the professor said. He changed the position of the tube in my hand so that it hovered over his saw blade, then began to cut through more bone. The neurophysiologists tell me her seizures originate just under here. He tapped the exposed skull with a pair of forceps. The noise was like a coin dropped on porcelain. That's where the seizures are coming from. So we'll cut out the source of the seizures, I asked. Yeah, but the source is very close to the area responsible for speech and she won't thank us if we make her mute in the process. Once he'd sawn through the skull, the professor prized in little levers similar to those used to take the tire from a bike wheel and lifted up a medallion of bone. He handed it to the nurse. Don't lose that, he said. <laughs> the, the window was about five centimetres in diameter and revealed the dura mater, the protective layer that lies beneath the skull, shiny and opalescent like the inside of a mussel shell. The professor removed that too and I looked down on a disc of creamy pink matter, ribbed like sand at low tide with blood vessels traced over its surface and filaments of purple and red. The brain itself was slowly pulsating, rising and falling with each beat of the patient's heart. And then he moved on to uh, ask the patient to, to speak. A speech therapist was brought in and would show cards and the patient had to say what was on the cards while the professor um, mapped out bits of the brain. And every time he'd checked that the patient could speak um, despite knocking out a piece of the brain, he would put a little sticker on it. Say, so, like, that bit's okay, you can take that bit out. Until eventually he'd mapped it out and he could remove the piece that was causing the epilepsy without damaging the eloquent brain. But you've got to read this bit too. Ah. <laughs> okay. Once Claire was asleep again, the professor removed a chunk of her brain, the epileptogenic part, and dropped it into a bin. What was that chunk responsible for? I asked him. He shrugged. No idea, he said. <laughs> We just know it's not eloquent. Will she notice any change? Probably not. The rest of her brain will adapt. I mean, I was just gobsmacked. I mean, this is one of the country's most eminent neurosurgeons who just dumped a bit of brain in the bin because he didn't understand what it did. He understood what it didn't do. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very small chunk. And of course, I mean, they know very much what they're doing. And it's a, a part of brain in the parietal lobe up here, which has not been particularly essential for anything that we can pinpoint, nice. but is obviously involved in doing something to do with the way we conceptualize the world. But then other parts of the brain take over. And that's what's so amazing. You know, you can see in brains of people who've been, for example, rendered deaf, completely deaf, and they've got this huge area of cortex, which is responsible for processing the acoustic world. And you, if you go and look at their brains years later, you'll find that part of brain that used to process sound has been taken over doing something completely different. So it's now processing aspects of the visual world or so on. And using your map mapping metaphor, how much of the human brain remains uncharted? Is, is the brain the last terra incognita on the human map? Uh, no, not at all, not at all. I mean, there's a huge amount about the brain we don't know, of course, and I'm not a neuroscientist anymore. I moved uh, sideways from that, but... Um, you know, we don't we don't really know the first thing about most of the way the body works really we don't understand the immune system that's why it's not what you want to hear your gp yeah. say by the way <laughs> yeah well we still haven't got to the bottom of most autoimmune conditions you know from multiple sclerosis to rheumatoid arthritis we still don't really understand most digestive conditions we don't really understand the complexity of it there's more nerves in your gut than there are in your brain for example so yeah we've got a long way to go everywhere really but the brain is a big part of it nice gosh <laughs> You, you dissect a human brain and discover a small lump 
like a grey pea, which a fellow student tells you is the pineal body, the seat of the soul. Uh. What, what does the pineal body actually do for us? Does it help us pray or what does it do? Well, the, pi the pineal uh, body or the pineal gland is a tiny little gland between your two hemispheres. And Descartes famously in the 1600s thought it was the seat of the soul because it was the only part of the brain he could find that was um, not paired. You know, it was just one thing right in the middle. And he thought, oh, that must be where human souls live. But actually, it is, if you look at it under a microscope, it's got light-sensitive tissue in it. And if you look at reptile brains or fish brains, the pineal gland is so close to the surface that it responds to ambient light. And so it's the pineal gland that tells us whether it's summer or winter. Mm. Um, and it still does that. You know, everybody nowadays takes melatonin for their um, jet lag, and melatonin is produced by the, the, uh, the pineal gland. So it's the pineal gland. It's, it's amazing if you look at it in the dissection of the brain, you know, all these nerve fibers go from your retinas to the back of your brain where we um, process vision. But there's a few stray ones are derailed and they go off into the pineal gland to tell the pineal gland, even though it's now buried in the core of your head, how light it is outside, whether we're in an 18 hour sunlight day, uh, summer day or a six hour summer in summer uh, winter day in Orkney, for example. It tells us about the seasons. Sometimes quite hard to tell the difference in England between <laughs> summer and winter. Yeah, yeah. Um, in your chapter on the lung, you, you tell us the building on the sort of word origins from our earlier session. The <laughs> word lung comes from the German lungen, derived from an Indo-European word meaning light. And Renaissance thinkers believed our soul uh, is attached most firmly to our body at the lips. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they attach such importance to the lips? And why should that be the seat of the soul for Renaissance thinkers? Um, well, uh, if you think, I mean, butchers still call the lungs the lights, don't they? they because they're the lightest mm. part of the body. They're just like foam, they're like sponge. Mm. And um, the word we use for, like the, the Greek word, um, uh, they use the word pneuma which mm. is to do with spirit. Mm. And um, there's different kind of, it's like, almost like the Indian uh, association of um, prana, the breath mm. is also related to soul. Or in China, you would say chi, which is related also to soul and to breath. And I think it's because it's the most obvious defining feature of a living person is their breath. You know, we would hold a mirror up to the lips to see if it mists, to see if somebody is still alive mm. until not that long ago. Mm. So. I think that's where this idea of, of anima, soul, animation, movement comes from. Um, the, the ultimately, it's our breath that keeps us alive. And it's when our breath starts to, uh, to fail, then that's when we need to worry about our soul detaching. And, and do you think there is anything that outlives our physical body? Uh, do I believe in the soul? That's a big question for a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, you know, if I had the answer to that, John, I would... Yeah. You wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, personally, no, I believe, um, I believe that we have hugely complex and important essential afterlives, but it's all to do with the consequences of our actions. Mm. And every action that we have, every decision we make, sets off colossal, unimaginably complex ripple effects everywhere around the globe. That, so we all have a thousand million afterlives because every decision we ever make goes on rippling long after we're gone. Mm. Um, but yeah, I can't see I'm a materialist from the other point of view. Mm. You know, every seven, if you don't count the enamel of our teeth, every seven to ten years, all the atoms of our body are replaced anyway. So there's nothing left of us ten years time from what we were before, apart from the enamel of your teeth, which was laid down in childhood and doesn't ever move. Seems to be getting replaced with more and more faulty parts in my case. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, but it's kind of amazing you know, that, that archaeologists of the future will be able to, if you, excuse me, please, I apologize. Uh, I want you to, to imagine your body in a graveyard in 10,000 years. Right. Archaeologists of the future will be able to find your teeth and say where you grew up and where you lived in later adulthood because the strontium isotopes in your tooth enamel can pinpoint the part of the world that you grew up in because of the strontium isotopes in the water that you drink. So Incredible. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> um, you talk about the eye and you talk about um, the writer George Louis Borges who went blind the very year he was appointed director of Argentina's National yeah, Library, yeah. found himself wandering a labyrinth of a million books 
and unable to read any of them. Mm. Uh, and you write beautifully, just as the constellations become visible only in darkness, it was through the slow nightfall of his blindness that it became clear to him how much literature he still had to explore. Mm. And he, he, he got his students to read the Anglo-Saxon and Norse sagas, epic sagas allowed to him mm -hmm. in the library, which is a wonderful image. And <clears throat> I wonder what you could tell us what's happening physiologically when you lose one faculty and the remaining faculties somehow compensate or become more acute. Yeah, well, we, we touched on that a minute ago, didn't we, about plasticity and brain plasticity is a phenomenon which people are still figuring out every day. But, but there's no doubt that if you lose one faculty, another one improves. You know, people, just, just off the top of my head, you know, you can think of the example of um, if somebody becomes blind in later life, it's then possible to develop such heightened hearing that it's now well recognised that, that many blind people can use a form of echolocation as they walk around. So by sort of making noises or clapping or even their footfall, they start learning how far away walls are because they start hearing the echoes. And that's a capacity you only develop because you've lost Is that your vision. Is they tap the white stick? Yeah, and tapping yeah. can do it too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, we've all got these wonderful potentials that can unfold if we ever have to. Uh, Borges is a really interesting case. I mean, he was a genius polymath, as I'm sure you'll know, a polyglot polymath who spoke about 10 languages anyway before, before that. And he had this encyclopedic knowledge, not only of all these scriptures in Anglo-Saxon, the sagas and Anglo-Saxon epics, but he could remember which page and which bit of the page a particular um, bit was. So I don't know if you've ever come across his incredible book of imaginary beings. He wrote this book of imaginary beings, which he essentially just ransacked his own memory. He told his students, oh, there's a wonderful one about uh, Chinese Himalayan soul stealer. I'm sure it's on page 352 of whatever. And his students would go off and read it and put it into this book. So that book was written when he was losing his vision. Wow. Yeah. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the flyer for this festival uh, prominently features the word sex on it. Um, so I thought we might skip your chapters on the kidney, the liver and the rectum <laughs> and head straight for genitalia. OK. That's all right. Um, I've unearthed some fascinating facts in this book, uh -huh. available for sale. Down there. <laughs> Vibrators were invented to treat women suffering from hysteria. And some of these devices had fittings so they could be driven by a home sewing machine. <laughs> I mean, that, that's like the ultimate multitasking, isn't it? Does it still, does it work? And well, do you prescribe this? No, no. <laughs> I mean, this is, um, I'm sure as well, many of you know, there's a very kind of misogynistic ancient Greek view of, of the idea of hysteria, which was, which it's ridiculous that it was assumed that it was a thing that happened only to women. I mean, Freud wrote his famous studies on hysteria. He had, Freud had male hysteric patients, but he only wrote up the female ones. And so mm. Freud perpetuated this idea that hysteria um, was a thing to do with um, femininity, which is a load of rubbish. But the, um, the ancient Greeks, right up to the early moderns, uh, lo a local local doctor around here, Thomas Brown, uh, was a fantastic doctor and uh, made a lot of new words in English, English, English language just a few miles up the road, they all had this idea that hysteria was caused by the womb detaching itself and moving around the body, which gave rise to fainting fits and swooning, pins and needles, all these kinds of symptoms that get bracketed under this term, hysteria. And of course, in the, the Greeks who had a slave society and felt very much that women should just be at home and producing babies, they said, oh, yeah, it must be to do with the fact they're not getting enough sex or something. And that was perpetuated right up until, yeah, until the 19th century. I mean, it's incredible, really, that, that they managed to get away with it that long. Mm. But, but, yeah, this is the, the, the kind of misogynistic foundations of medicine that we're only really starting to shake yourselves free of in the 20th century. So, no, nobody recommends that anymore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not sure this. I think the sewing machine companies are glad. Eh? <laughs> you mentioned a survey in Western countries which found that only a third of women regularly experience orgasm during intercourse. Mm. Why is this? Is it to do with the difference between the male and the female mind or body? I don't know. You need to ask somebody other than me, I think. Right. 
Um, well, there is a session on sex tomorrow. Maybe yeah. we should both attend it. Yeah, I should definitely ask. I mean, I th it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, that must be must be a whole cocktail of things to do with um, socialization, social expectation. Again, a good, healthy, uh, unhealthy, sorry, dose of misogyny. Um, there must be loads of reasons for that. And it would be fascinating to know, I'm not an anthropologist by any way, but it'd be fascinating to know how reproducible that is in other cultures mm. other than the West. Mm. You know, and it shouldn't be that hard to do a good study on that. I, re I read a wonderful study done in Israel about, um, for example, symptoms of menopause, cultural experience of symptoms of menopause, because there's so many different ethnic groups living within Israel. They did a wonderful study where they took a whole load of women that were all the same age, um, all living in the same city, uh, but depending on their cultural background, they had a completely different experience of menopause. Mm. So, yeah, there's uh, a lot of um, untrodden ground there, academically speaking, I think. Maybe mm. you could uh, explore well, it yourself. Well, well, I was thinking it might be your next book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. During lockdown, we, um, we went to the Lake District. We did a lot of wild and cold water swimming, which has become very popular in, mm -hmm. in, um, in lockdown. And... Um, it was incredibly invigorating. We swam every morning in Loughrigg Tarn. Mm -hmm. And I Googled the health benefits of cold water swimming, and there were 10. And number seven was increases your libido. Oh, really? And I wondered whether that was, what, what's going on there, or is it? I think it just um, I think it wakes up your whole system, doesn't it? I mean, it's funny that warm water seems to take your energy. Mm. You know, if you have a hot bath, you feel kind of wasted with lassitude afterwards. Whereas if you jump in the sea, Cold water just seems to wake you up. It must be to do with um, adrenaline and cortisol levels. We were talking about that, the effects of swearing on your cortisol. Um, it must be to do with uh, cold water swimming will certainly boost your cortisol levels and it will also boost your adrenaline. So the answer is to, as you dive in, to swear loudly at her. <laughs> yeah. Well, it clearly makes you feel more alive. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's because of the proximity of death. I don't know. <laughs> My wife's a great fan of cold water swimming, but I am no. I, You're not into it. Oh no, no. I get the little kind of the wetsuit, gloves, and socks even in the summertime. You know. <laughs> Let's move on to your next book, Island Dreams, um, mm -hmm. which charts also available for sale, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm only on ten percent commission. <laughs> charts your obsession with maps and islands over a decade of wandering. What? What I loved about this was there's lots of pictures and the typeface is really large for ageing eyes. So <laughs> it's, a very good, it's a very good read. You, um, you write very beautifully about a trip to the Arctic archipelago mm -hmm. uh, off the northern tip of Norway. And I just wondered if you could read, read that passage on the Lofoten Islands. It marks it up a bit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is a description of the Lofoten Islands. You know, I said at the beginning that I wanted to be a geographer originally, and it's a real treat for me to write books about travel and to spend time going through old maps. I like the way maps show us how land used to be imagined. Um, and and the, so that I filled this book with maps so that I could kind of, as well as enjoy revisiting all these islands and the way they've been imagined in the past in words, I could do it in pictures. And this is a passage about about the Lofoten Islands in, uh, in uh, Arctic Norway. The slopes of the Lofoten Mountains were carpeted in a thick moss that moulded itself around my body as I slept. The tensions of the African journeys I've just described dissolved. We climbed a mountain overlooking the original maelstrom, a tidal whirlpool between two of the islands. My sleep was interrupted by the croaking of ravens. About midnight one night, I was woken by Claire to see an aurora borealis. The lights were just beginning, a small flame of grey haze against the night. And from the cliff top, we watched them multiply. Columns of green conjured from nothing only to flourish and then evanesce. A wash of swirling luminescence rose and fell, like marbled end papers spread over the book of the sea. Meteorites flashed through the ionosphere and, at one moment, Standing high on the island ridge, I was surrounded on all sides by vertical pillars of grey-green light stretching up to infinity. Sometimes the flames came quickly, but more often they moved imperceptibly, so that as I turned my attention away from one part of the horizon and back, I hadn't noticed a movement, but the scene had changed. And I sat up watching the lights until the filament of crimson along the northern horizon fattened to a dull dawn. More light rose from the horizon in chromatography columns, 
dissolving the aurora into the gathering day. Thanks. You write that your isolation on Lofoten was beneficial and even therapeutic. Mm. And this touches on a recurrent theme in your book about the tension between connection and isolation. Mm. It made me think about what E.M. Forster wrote in the frontispiece of Howard's End, um, Only Connect. Mm. Those were the f words that were the philosophy of the Schlegel sisters mm -hmm. trying to connect different, bridge different social classes. And the frontispiece of your book could almost be Only Isolate. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you could unpack this idea a bit more and tell us how your travels might have resolved this tension. Um, well, I, I think that, like many people, I, I share a love of isolated places. You know, I came here from the sleeper from Edinburgh after flying down from Orkney. I was doing a locum until yesterday as a GP on one of the littler islands of Orkney. Um, and I love going to that kind of environment because I feel so separate from all the cares of my life in the city. I feel I get perspective. I feel like it gives, makes me see in much greater clarity the contrast of what's important in my life and what isn't. But then also I love going back to the city and all the plurality and the possibility and the fertility of the connections that you get in the city. And so I think that there's a balance to be struck there between isolation and connection. And there's a paradox too, you know, it's very easy to get isolated in the city, but in a small community, you can feel very deeply connected. Mm -hmm. um, Winnicott, Donald Winnicott, the great pediatrician, psychoanalyst, that I love very much his writings, um, he felt very much that adolescents need to learn a bit of isolation in order to, to grow, for their egos to develop as independent people. And that if you didn't allow teenagers the possibility of that isolation, then they, they couldn't develop properly. But he, 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 he made a very strong distinction between isolation and insulation. Insulation being somebody that's too cut off, that's completely self-centered, that doesn't have any line of communication whatsoever left anymore. And that's a balance that I think I'm always trying to achieve in my own life. And I've, I do it both by retreating into myself when I'm in the city and I do it by these sort of repeated lunges north into, the, into Orkney or Shetland for periods of time and then I come back to Edinburgh. So it's a balance that I'm still trying to work out. Yeah. And there's a character from Moby Dick that you reference who, uh, who somehow achieves a, a state oh, yeah. of mind that you're... Oh, Queequeg, yes. Queequeg's a great hero of Moby Dick, isn't he? He's the Pacific Islander and harpoonist, uh, for those of you who know that book. Um, and um, he had an amazing kind of self-possession that, that Melville writes about. He says, um, Queequeg never consorted at all or but very little with the other seamen in the inn. He seemed entirely at his ease, preserving the utmost serenity, content with his own companionship, always equal to himself. And it was it's a beautiful description of somebody, and we've all met people like that, haven't we, that are completely self-possessed. They're not cut off from people around them, but neither do they need the people around them. And it's a kind of equanimity, it's a kind of ballast, um, safety and security that I'm always trying to search out, I think. Hmm. That's wonderful. Um, you also talk about the Hindu tradition of the four phases of life, of um, being a, a student, a, a householder, Mm -hmm. a, um, an, an ascetic, um, mm -hmm. and it, it made me wonder whether um, you could also, I mean, are you about to head off and renunciate everything in search of isolation, and how, how are you going to explain that to your wife? Yeah, my kids, well, she would head off to the drop of a hat as well. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've forged a kind of life where we both, we're both great explorers before we had kids, and we're both having to find a kind of tension, a resolution of that tension now. But yeah, I found a kind of resolution in that, as did she, which is, I love this idea that there are just phases to life. And I had a phase in my life where I traveled constantly and I was working as a junior doctor. And in those days, uh, senior house officer jobs came up six months at a time. So it was quite easy to, to work very, very hard, 100 hours a week for six months, save lots of money, and then spend six months traveling and do that cycle. And I did that for quite a few years, traveling all over the world. Um, Whereas now with kids, it's much, much harder. And I love that idea that you just accept that this is a householder phase and this, you don't travel so much. But then comes another phase when your kids grow up and you start and that, that kind of experience of re-experience of isolation when people are less dependent on you becomes possible. Hmm. I think I'm hopefully moving towards that again, as is she. Let's just look at your last book, Intensive Care. 
a GP, a community, and COVID-19, uh, which is a very personal account of how the pandemic broke over uh, your practice in Edinburgh. Mm. You wrote that the plague year of 2020 was the most intense of your professional life. Uh, and caring for so many people must have taken a huge toll on your, on your mental health. How did you maintain a sense of hope and did the arts or your writing or your love of islands play a role? How did you mm. stay positive? Yeah, it was exhausting, really, wasn't it? I mean, we all had to relearn so many things at the beginning of this pandemic. We had to reinvent the wheel um, from the point of view of, uh, of, well, no, not reinvent the wheel. We had to find completely new ways, sorry, of, of establishing connections and, and doing my job. I mean, when I was trained as a doctor, there were always the rule was see the patient. If you've got any doubt, see the patient. Put your hand on their stomach. Put your stethoscope on their chest. Whereas suddenly we were being told by the GMC it is your responsibility to not see the patient, to keep them safe by not doing a home visit. You know, trying to guess what's wrong with people down the phone is completely against the grain of all my training. So we had to rediscover all that. At the same time as we were coping with um, staff absences and huge amount of stress, a sort of tsunami of mental health problems as everyone lost their jobs and um, the insecurity. So many people in Edinburgh are be, uh, dependent on, the, um, on tourist income, uh, the students all hoping for this great liberation of university, suddenly just in halls of residence, uh, hutch rooms. So there was a lot of challenges in that. But, but what I hope comes across in this book, that, that we also we have just come through the most extraordinary ordeal, yet we've learned so much. There's so much positive that I have taken out of this last year, as not just as, as, as a citizen and a human being, but also as a, as a doctor and member of a profession. Um, we've just overcome the most extraordinary obstacles in a very short period of time and I take great heart and inspiration from that and um, just um, think we're going to it's completely changed the way we approach medicine and it's going to completely change lots and lots of disciplines and professions we'll always be able to look back on when people say in the future naysayers say oh we can't do that or you couldn't do that we just say well didn't we do it in 2020 when we had to hmm. you know red tape was cut you know uh, part of the thread of this book goes through the fact that in Edinburgh, all the homeless people were housed mm. overnight, mm. overnight. So a, 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 an agreement was brokered between the charities that look after homeless people, the Bethany Trust, the Cyrenians and so on. The hotels that were standing empty, Scottish government and the city council, they all just came together and went, right, OK, everybody gets a hotel room. And, um, and so we solved it after years of kind of hand wringing. So that kind of thing was most extraordinarily inspirational, really. There's an extraordinary statistic in your book that the life expectancy of a, a rough sleeper is something like 46. Yeah, in Edinburgh, yeah. I mean, that's really shocking. That's, that's what, 40, 30, 40 years less than we might hope to achieve, yeah. I guess. Yeah, uh, life expectancy in Chad is 54 and in Gaza is 52. Wow. But in Edinburgh, if you're a rough sleeper, it's uh, 46. And the women are even younger, 42, 43, if you're a woman. So, yeah, extraordinary. I was, um, I was thinking about the sort of connection between physical and mental health. I was reading a book by mm. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and actually on the cover there's a picture of him. I don't know if I can demonstrate this with a pen, but um, oh, I don't think I have my pen, but... <laughs> oh, it's there. Thank you very much. There's a picture of him actually with a pencil, and he's going like this. And... He says, if you put a pencil in your mouth and go like that, you will automatically start feeling more cheerful. Wow. And I, I thought, wow, I can't, surely happiness can't be that simple. <laughs> you have to What's go around all on? the time with a pencil <laughs> in your mouth. What's going on there? Well, I have no idea. You need to ask Daniel Cannon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, uh, I, I was, so Joanne needs to invite him next Oh, yeah, year. absolutely. Mm. No, there must be something to do with... Uh, Positive feedback and uh, engaging with the world and dopamine. On, I have no idea. But, I'm but sure. you said when you when you were uh, dissecting faces, you found some that had highly developed smiling muscles, and you could oh, always yeah. tell someone's character by the size of the muscles behind yeah. the skin. Yeah, this is a part of adventures in human being. I used to um, I paid my way through medical school by being an anatomy dissector during the summer holidays. So I've dissected a lot of human faces. On the, on the, you, there was an article in the FT and you said you're an anatomy, anatomy demonstrator, which sounded more like a sort of nail stripper. Ah, <laughs> like, no, no. 
like a male model. Yeah. Um, no, a demonstrator. So my job was to um, prosect the cadavers so that to demonstrate various aspects of anatomy for students so that ah. they could see on the body, for example, the branches of the median nerve in the, in the forearm, or they could see the branches of the carotid artery in the face. So yeah, I've dissected a lot of faces and uh, there really are some people who have got great big chunky smiling muscles. Um, and there are people who've got big chunky frowning muscles. <laughs> Wow. And there's a lot of good evidence to show that ultimately the more your facial expression shows levity, mirth, happiness, the happier you will be. So keep so smiling. There, so there is something in it, isn't oh, there? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's lovely, I don't know if you've ever seen Leonardo da Vinci's um, uh, anatomical drawings, they're magnificent. You know, he was like 300 years ahead of his time. And he called the muscles after their emotion. So he called that, you know, the one that does that, he called it the muscle of fear. Um, or he called that one. Uh, that wrinkles up your nose, he called it the muscle of anger. And, uh, and he was convinced, yes, that, that they were in constant communication with the seat of the soul. And the more you portrayed a particular expression, the, the more you felt mm. that particular emotion. Mm. Yeah, it's a lovely idea, I'm sure it's true. So uh, we've got a bit of time for Q&A. Um, as long as your question isn't something like, have you got a cure for my bunions, doctor? <laughs> we're, we're open There's to, always one. to anything. We have mics left and right. The lady in green, thank you. I'm just really interested in this um, looking after the homeless in Edinburgh. What, where are they all now? Uh, well, there's still a... We've gone through three iterations of the homeless hostel. Um, it was a hotel at the east end of the city did the most of it. But now there's a hotel at the west end of the city. I don't know how well you know Edinburgh, but it's near Haymarket that is um, the current homeless shelter. So there's an aspiration, I don't know how long it will last, but there's definitely an aspiration that there's no going back to the street. And uh, certainly the city council has massively scaled up its uh, temporary emergency housing provision so that people can come to this hotel. And you know the, the health, public health benefits are extraordinary because they get vaccinations, they get off heroin, they get onto methadone, they get all these wonderful things happen once they've got a bed to sleep in. And then they get moved on into city council accommodation. So that's the hope. So far? Oh, front right here, please. Thanks. Um, would you encourage your children to train as doctors now? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a terrible, uh, grim process going through medical school, especially when you've got to do it on Zoom. You know, mm. I teach the first year's community medicine. It's just dire trying to kind of inspire them and give them enthusiasm about your subject on a team screen. But um, yeah, medicine is just the most amazing profession. You know, if you're curious about people and you're curious about the world, you can't ask for a better job because, you know, you get to constantly exercise your, your uh, intellect and your curiosity. You get to help people in a really direct, practical way. You get this sort of um, constant stream of people coming and sitting next to you telling you about their lives and, um, and saying, oh, I've got this really you know, this problem, they tell you all about their life and they say, can you do anything about it? And sometimes you say, no, sorry, I can't do anything about that. But sometimes you can, and a lot of the time you can. And it's very satisfying, particularly my job being a GP, because, you know, I used to work in hostels, as I said, I started out as a trainee surgeon and then I did emergency medicine and expedition medicine. But general practice is fantastic because, you know, everything from a bunion or gout in your toe, which is a very satisfying thing to treat because it gets better, right through to people having midlife crisis or, um, you know, florid, psychotic, schizophrenic episodes. The whole of human life is there uh, in the clinic, morning to evening. So, yeah, do it. That's what I would say. Oh, a gentleman at the back. <coughs> a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, how do you see the future of telemedicine unfolding? And do doctors hate it? Um, or do they think there are great advantages in speaking to the patient but not seeing the patient? Oh. Um, and the second question is just about the NHS and whether you feel the, the NHS in Scotland is, uh, operates better than in England mm, okay. and is better funded. Um, well, both quite political questions, I suppose. My first, as I, I mean, telemedicine it just depends on the individual. You know, some consultants I heard of loved it when suddenly they didn't have to see patients anymore. And they could just sit in their office and dial them in on Zoom. 
Um, my experience, nearly all of my GP colleagues hated it, really hated it, and I still hate it. I'm back now after 18 months of this nonsense, I'm, I'm back to about 50-50, so half my patients, I get them into the clinic, the other half I'm doing it by phone or by Zoom, or well, the equivalent of Zoom, NHS near me it's called. Um, and I think you miss things, you miss things a lot. You know, the big pleasure of being a GP is that so often patients will test you out with their first couple of questions. You know, they're not really interested with their first couple of questions in your answer. They're just trying you out to see if you're the kind of person they can risk with the big thing they want to ask you. And all that's gone, all that subtlety is gone. And you would think it would be faster doing it all on Zoom or on the phone, but the clinics take much longer because you can just eyeball somebody, you can see whether you need to be worried about them or not. But on the phone, it's almost impossible to figure out whether you need to be worried about them. So I'm not a fan and there are very few fans. I think there's a lot of accountants would like us to do it um, because it will be cheaper. And that's good, you know, it's public money. We have to spend it the best way we can. But I just, I don't think it's proper medicine. Um, and with regard, it's really hard for me to say whether NHS in Scotland is better run because I've, I've not worked in the NHS in England since 2002. So it's a long time ago. Um, for people who don't know the difference, in Scotland we don't really have nearly as much of uh, clinical commissioning groups. We don't have an internal market. We don't have... Um, you know, you don't get Virgin or Boots coming in buying up GP practices. We don't have any of that in Scotland. It's still all um, public-led. Um, and it's got advantages and disadvantages. But personally, I, I prefer it, I think. Friends of mine who qualified as GPs and went to work for big uh, consortia uh, GP practices in England don't enjoy it as much. They don't have the kind of autonomy. They feel much like they're becoming tiny little cogs without much professional independence. Um, so I think from that point of view, it's not been good for a lot of GPs. But then, uh, you know, that's a political question. What do you want? Would you want more? Do you want more accountability and more better balancing of the books? Then you probably would go for that. Um, but I don't think it gives you good medicine. Ultimately, you can't really have a market in healthcare, And we see that in America. You know, America has got the most, they spend the biggest amount per head on health in the, in the entire world. And they have the worst outcomes. They have terrible infant mortality. They have horrendous, horrendous outcomes. But they spend 50% more than us per head on health. And that's because I think ultimately when you're sick, you need somebody you can trust. And if you're all vying in a competitive market, it's very, very difficult. So I've got patients who are very wealthy who have private health care and uh, they'll come back from their private consulting, consulting episode telling them what the consultant wanted them to do, but they'll ask my advice, which one, because they know I don't get paid anymore. You know, I, I, my pay doesn't change depending on what I advise. Whereas in a private system, there's always that little element of doubt. You, I mean, NHS is full of wonderfully professional, brilliant doctors who do private work, but there's always that little seed of doubt that, is he recommending that because it's more expensive, better paid for him? Whereas we don't have that really in Scotland, which is mm. good. Follow-up question, just about, about big data and um, how big data is changing medicine. And I think most of us in this room are going to have our, our data unsold by the NHS, and there's obviously a big campaign about opting out of that at the moment. Mm. I mean, what is big data? What are the advantages of big data? And to your point about it being very commercial, yeah, um, it's who, gain, who benefits from it? It's wonderful. Big, I mean, it's just a resource like any other. You know, if you can crunch the numbers of 50 million people's blood pressure, 50 million people's cholesterol, 50 million people's glucose levels, you can crunch all those numbers and, and come up with some wonderful algorithms about their health, improving their health. But it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's back to the tragedy of the commons. Who owns that? So should you allow a private firm who's smarter and quicker to use that data for personal profit, or should you have uh, an umbrella organization, an organization within the umbrella of the NHS who is managing and getting the benefit of that profit. And there's advantages and disadvantages of both. But, um, so big data is a wonderful thing and it's gonna transform medicine over the next 20 to 30 years. But I would really hate to see the fruits of that just get hived off into uh, private hands. Because it's a common resource. We're out of time, I'm afraid. But um, mm. Gavin, before we finish, I wonder if I could just ask you to read a lovely poem from the back of your, your latest book, which um, I think helped you through mm. the, the last 
difficult 12 months. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So this is a lovely poem by a, a Scottish novelist called James Robertson. Some of you may know some of his books. James Robertson is a poet and a um, short story writer and a novelist. And, um, and I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. And uh, he was commissioned to write a poem for one of the presidents, outgoing president last year. What a year to finish off your tenure as the president of the College of Physicians in the middle of the pandemic. But anyway, James wrote this beautiful poem for the outgoing president. And I'm just going to read you a few short lines from the end of it. Your patient is your mirror. Therefore, look with sympathy. Work with the faults and flaws. See the stories and the scars. Replace what worn out parts can be replaced and, when remedy cannot be found, in the last resort, be kind. The world needs all the kindness it can get. Our time is short. The snake casts off its skin. The cockerel calls up the morning light. We glimpse the centaur leaping in the wood. We work. We live. We love. We say good night. But not just yet. Although I will now disappear, life is what you are for and why you are here. Gavin, thank you very much.